on his life. Oh, yeah, because you guys have data plans. Think. Director Hendricks, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to today's City Board of Directors Board Agenda Meeting for May the 25th. This is our opportunity to review the agenda for our formal board meeting uh, that will be held on June 1st. Board members, are there any questions from items 1 through 5? Board members, are there any questions from items 1 through 5? Mayor. Mayor. I guess let me. Let me Director Wright, if you. Yeah. Let me find my little face thing here. Not yet. There you go. There I am. Yes, ma'am. Item 6, new well development. What is that? That may be uh, Director Collins or Director Honeywell. Was that Director? Six. I believe that deals with one of our franchise fees. Or... It'll be three. It's item six. It's item three. Item three? Such you said six. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Item three. It okay. Yeah. Item three. Maybe I said six because I was looking at Ward six. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I heard six, but, <laughs> but Director Warwick knew what you were talking about. So, so, so Director Wright, we're talking about the property at Canid, at the corner of Canis and Bowman. Is that the, yeah, that's, that is actually property that we acquired as part of the Canis and Bowman Road construction improvement projects. That's the old liquor store uh, that's on the, I guess the southeast corner. Uh, of that intersection, uh, the city had ended up purchasing that entire piece of property because of the development impact for the road construction. Uh, and we're actually the parts that we need to keep is right away. We're keeping the remainder of that. We are selling to an adjacent property owner that came to us with an offer with this offer to purchase that property. So that's so that we can finish the Canis Road and, and the Bowman and the Bowman Road. So we don't have to go so far over to off to the right. So it'll, it'll straighten that out in there. No, 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 not that far south. This is at Bowman and Canis. That the intersection. Store, yes, the liquor store. That's what I thought. Yeah. But it, it was kind of like going closer to that. On the to the right, so this will allow us to go straighter. Maybe I'm thinking. I guess it depends on what I, I can talk to you afterwards. We can start. Yeah. I, I know what sure what's right you're, you're referring to, but the liquor store is being removed for us to build the, the project. This is selling the remainder of that liquor store property that we purchased to someone that wanted to buy it. We're going to have the what property we need to build the road where it's more of a straight intersection. Mm -hmm. The remainder is what this is is conveying to this. I other. guess that was what my question was, and it wasn't coming out right. So maybe I won't ask. Any I, more I probably wasn't listening. <laughs> well, but it will straighten out that help us straighten out that yes, intersection. Sir. Yes. This is a long overdue project, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from one through five? Director Phillips, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank our city manager and staff. We received an email uh, from people who watch our meetings online, and they want to be able to follow along. So now on our screens, there is now a tile that says consider agenda items one through five. So if you're watching online, the reason why that was added because we've been responsive to uh, the people of Little Rock and you can check out the agenda for littlerock.gov and you can see what those actual items are. But just wanted to publicly state uh, thanks to the city manager and the staff and let people watching who are watching at home or on their phones or wherever, uh, the reason why that towel is on the screen so they can follow along. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Director Phillips. Any questions by items six through nine? Questions for item six through nine. Seeing none. Any questions from item ten? Director Webb. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There, there have been a lot of questions about this, and could 
Um, on one of the communications we got, it said incorrectly that the staff had recommended denial, and then that was corrected to say that the staff had recommended approval. And could we get an update or a presentation on that? Yes, ma'am. Director Collins. Six. Ten. No, ten. Ten. No, ten. <laughs> you had the same thing with me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> What's on item number six that everybody's so interested about? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were on camera. <laughs> Director right, Collins, if you would speak to item number 10. Yes, sir. Uh, item number 10 uh, for the board, uh, the planning commission met on March 11th. Uh, it was presented uh, to the planning commission with a recommendation of approval by staff. The uh, commission voted to den deny the application. Only five voted for, six was against. There was nobody absent. In that presentation to the uh, commission, there was individuals that did speak uh, against the item. There was four that spoke against the item. There was one that spoke for the item. Uh, on the ones that spoke against, the main concerns that they raised was noise, traffic, uh, negative Im effect of the proposed dog park. Uh, the noise they were talking about was from just the barking dog. There's, there is an area on the proposed plan. I think if we could bring up the uh, the sketch, it could show the area that they're looking to kind of utilize uh, part of that existing building. If we could zoom in, you kind of see the area over to the right. That's that is existing right now, a vacant area that was used as a construction laid down area for the company that was there in that air and that deal. If you look kind of halfway, there's an area that says outdoor play area. That is the proposed area that is open to the, to the outside, but is up, but at the same time is surrounded by existing buildings uh, that are to the south and to the east and north, but and also a proposed fence and area that's going to be uh, to the east. Uh, so the concern was is that the, the the barking of that area in their presentation, uh, they talked about limiting the number of um, uh, the the dogs at one time in this area. It's 50 uh, dogs to be at any given time in there. Uh, the applicant also proposed that the the proposed hours of operation is 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now this is a kennel, so therefore you know the stay is overnight. On that, the, they were proposing to put in a new privacy fence uh, that primarily is on the west side and also doing landscaping. So, if you look at what the applicant also proposes on some of that, they, they talked about, and I'm not a uh, expert necessarily on noise, but that barking noise is one of the criteria that several of the uh, citizens that came was uh, their uh, concern was about, and so. Uh, they presented what they would call, they are providing some soundproofing that would come to a level of what they would say sound transmission class 50, uh, which is ranked uh, from 25 to 50 to 60 and 60 being like the peak, which is very little sound is leaving. Uh, 50 would be kind of the norm of what would come in on a commercial uh, development to try to limit some of that uh, uh, for, you can, you can still hear it, but it is diminished at that location and it dissipates as you go away and they could do a lot better presentation on the sound you know uh, come next week because uh, that was part of their presentation and the looks now what's out there existing uh, and was brought out in the planning commission presentation was to the north of this development is apartment complexes just directly to the north uh, to the northwest is an office uh, development there is a uh, appears to be a single family home, but is zoned commercial in between the two, just to the north of this development. To the west of this development is an existing animal clinic. You know, so it is allowed in that type of zoning. It's just, since there's no overnight kennel stay for long terms, there might be an overnight stay through an operation or that type of scenario, but not where you're boarding animals. And directly to the south is a uh, auto repair tire business that's to the south of it, and then just south of that is uh, Highway 10. 
So some of the traffic concerns that was raised at that time was just the intersection of Foxcroft and how Cantrell comes in and how this street kind of uh, goes off to the east. So if we could bring up probably a zoning map would give us a better idea of that configuration. And so as you can see, if you can zoom in, that's that W street that comes off. Um, and it is a street, but at this moment in time with just no connectivity to the east, it is primarily functioning right now more as a uh, minor road just for access to the commercial properties uh, along that. But that uh, intersection where W comes in, it does make a, a little awkward intersection, but it is signalized intersection. So uh, even I drove it uh, the other day just to uh, refresh my memory of everything for coming to the board and in pulling out, you would have to wait for cars that are gonna pull out onto Cantrell uh, but there is an opportunity to go to pull out and get into the, the lane right there. Uh, you don't have to pull back to the north and go down Foxcroft to make a U-turn. And so one of the concerns was is how much traffic would be generated uh, for this development. And uh, and they had some consultants there that would address that. But uh, if, if this development uh, was approved and uh, we would require that type of research into analysis uh, when they do their development on their final plans. Uh, uh, one aspect that was also um, not brought out in detail at the Planning Commission uh, was also just height of where this development sits uh, topography wise to the surrounding area. Uh, if you look at the, you'll see the residential homes that are over to the east. Uh, one of them uh, was one of the uh, people that came and spoke for the development. He's just adjacent to this development. Uh, it's about a 30 foot vertical difference between uh, where this development is higher than the residential. And then as that slopes off, once it gets to that uh, Eastern property line, uh, the slope on the rear yards of those residential properties are uh, heavily wooded. Now, uh, in the time that we are today, it's green and there's hardwoods there. So in the winter time, there is a potential of uh, losing of the leaves in that wooded area, but there's also some evergreens in that area, small. Uh, and we would also look for if a development comes in and was approved, we look for more of that mid-level to try to dissipate some of that uh, sound noise to that residential area in that wintertime condition. So with that, is there any questions that, in, that uh, anybody may have? Director Wyrick, and then after Director Wyrick, uh, Director Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Collins, uh, it looks like from the application that they're uh, currently a C3 zoning and they're going to a PC, PZD. That's correct. That's correct, okay. Um, the building that's in front of this on the, my phone keeps going dead, uh, at the intersection of the W Street and the Foxcroft Road, what, what is that building? That you're talking about that C3 development that's just directly south of W Street. That is that uh, auto tire no, no, place. No, she's talking no. about the veterinary. It's a, it's a. Oh, the vet clinic. The vet clinic is directly to the uh, Left, west. Yes. West. Okay, so that's a veterinary clinic there. Yes, that's the Bellevue, I believe, uh, clinic. And Bellevue. Okay. Okay. That's where I was talking about. That's having somebody bring a uh, dog, cat, or some type of animal in to look at that clinic and get operated on and have a stay is not uncommon in that type of use. It's the kennel type scenario where you're boarding it for a longer period of time. Okay. And you talked about the the uh, vertical distance to the homes, I guess they're on White Oak Lane. Um, the open space for the dogs, how close is that going to be to the nearest resident? Well, it would be, I'll have to pull that up on the sketch if they've got a good dimension on it. Um, they're leaving that vacant area. If we could zoom into that site sketch. And that's approximately about 100 feet or so separation uh, on that vacant lot. From the play area to the... Uh, I guess from where that, the, the, yeah, it's 200, the whole property is 240 feet in length and it's about halfway. But if you look at the landscaping that would be installed in the fencing, that would leave them 
somewhere between 100 to 120 feet distance between where that development would be and the edge of the residential property line. Okay. Um, the residences that are there, are these large lots? Are they long, wide? I guess I'm looking for impact to the, the homes that live there from the property. Well, if you, if you look on, I'm trying to think of map that may show, well, you kind of see it on this one to the, that is on the east. There's uh, three lots that is direct, directly uh, adjacent to this property. Right. One of those is the one individual that spoke for the development. Uh, I do not believe the other two along that side was somebody that spoke at uh, the planning commission. I would have to go through uh, all the correspondence that we received at the planning commission to see if any of those individuals sent something in either for or against. Okay, and if if noise becomes a problem, uh, I know we've had some situations where you have a a lot of noise from a business that doesn't necessarily hit the people right around, but noise carries to some other residences. And you said that this one uh, is, it's 30 feet higher than the residences? Yes, is as, said? as it's going back east, uh, it's falling off or going down in elevation to the single family residential that's to the east. Uh, and in some ways, like I said, how sound travels, it travels for this instance, if you're talking dog barking, it's through the air. It's going to get dissipated a little bit just by distance and carry and also the trees and the other things that it would hit. Yeah. And also how they uh, do their development as far as the fencing and the landscaping and the walls that they would build around that outdoor play area uh, would also directly affect how that sound travels right. uh, to other areas. Now, if you look to the north, uh, that one development that's just to the northwest and the apartment complex are multi-story. So that also will account to some of that dissipation of noise. Uh, right in the middle, there is that single family. If you look at that, uh, uh, if we could bring back the zoning map where essentially the O3 is labeled on the Fox Chase, there is a single story building uh, that is just right in between the, the, the two story buildings that are right there. And I think the office may be a three-store building. I have to confirm that. Right at uh, the middle of that O3? Yes, where that O3 is labeled, that is a single-story building. And then to the north of that is condominiums uh, that are multi-story in height. Okay. Um, with 50 dogs, um, I think they first said 60, but now they're down to 50. Um, did did we do a traffic study or traffic count or what what does the staff think the count of vehicles is going to be um, additional going into Foxcroft Road and turning onto W Street? Uh, what do we have in our ordinance that if we have dogs being distributed, how many cars are we are we talking two cars a day for each dog? What, what does the staff see as the traffic? Well, typically that would be what we would look for because you're this, it's one individual or even if there's two individuals in that vehicle, they're bringing in, dropping it off. But typically they may not be dropping it off for that day. You know, if this is a kennel area or it could be a daycare area, we would uh, try to figure out what is the uh, average time, the peak and the average of what that traffic is for the, the dropping it off. If 50 is the max, we would use that as the trips that they would come in for the day. Now in their presentation, that may be the max, but that's not going to necessarily be the max that is outside in that play area at one, at any given time. They try to cycle that by the number of dogs that's there and how many is gonna be out there in the play area uh, uh, for that noise consideration. Oh, wait a minute. Are we talking 50 in the play area? No, or are we talking 50, 50 in the whole in the, unit? It's the everything. <laughs> Sorry, it's everything, not the whole play area. Okay. Total of 50. Total of 50. Okay. So you could say possibly 100, 100 trips. A and day. in the, uh, you know, four, and I'd have to go back and do a little more and look at what the traffic is and get with our traffic engineering department. But 50, to, uh, you know, 100 trips per day on Cantrell is 
not that significant of any type of increase. And please keep in mind that this may not be a destination that's taken somebody from uh, south or west Little Rock. It, it potentially is trips that is made by people in the area. Yeah, Those trips are already there. Yeah. And we'd have to account for that. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Director Richardson. Then uh, we'll have Vice Mayor Hines. Uh, yes, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Director Rory, uh asked one of my questions with respect to distance. Uh, Jamie, just to be sure, we are looking at an appeal of a denial of planning commission decision, correct? That is correct. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. And he said staff, I didn't, I got caught up in this number six thing going on down there. Did you say staff was recommending approval or not? Yes, staff was re uh, recommendation was for approval at the planning commission. And it fell to planning commission level five to six. Um, that's the correct number. That is the correct vote. It was five of uh, four and six against. And one in opposition down there, one in support. It was at the meeting. I heard you say, is that correct? That's right. One uh, citizen showed up in support of the application and four spoke against the application. Thank you, Jamie. Vice Mayor Hines. Thank you. Jimmy, because I use Bellevue Animal, they've got a kennel in that in that clinic, correct? In the in the existing veterinary clinic that's next door to this. Well, that the uh, development was approved as a vet clinic, and like I was explaining, they stay in there. Uh, you can utilize that for the clinic, you know, operation and stay. Uh, but this is treated more like a um, a just a flat out kennel. For no, no, but that's what I'm saying. But and under C3, an animal clinic with kenneling is a is an allowed use, correct? Under the zoning that already exists for this property. For uh, I'd have to pull that specific one up. Uh, I mean, is this property zoned C3 or not? It's zoned C3, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so an animal clinic's an allowed use in C3. Yes, animal clinic's allowed use. Okay, cool. So. We've got an animal clinic in that use that has a kennel already, yeah. correct? Yes, but it's okay. part of this, the animal clinic is the aspect of it. Right. That's why we went for the PCD. My, I know, but, <laughs> but my, and the PCD is more restrictive than the current zoning, correct? That's correct. That's when conditions can be placed because when, it, when you start getting into by even a C4, a kennel is not allowed as a by right use. It is a conditional use in a okay. C4. All right. So that would be the reason that y'all are yes. in support of it. Okay. Um, I think that's that's all I've got. Uh, that's all I've got on it. Thank you, Director Phillips. Uh, my question is similar to Director Hines. Uh, so, is a C four animal kennel is only permitted as a conditional use in a C four? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks, man. Any more questions in regards to item number ten? Seeing none, our agenda meeting is now adjourned. We'll now come into our policy meeting. Um, as we all are aware, um, I guess now, it, maybe 10 days ago, uh, maybe at least a week ago, uh, we received our first tranche of the American Rescue Plan Act funds uh, that are close to roughly $19 million. Uh, we received roughly $38 million. Um, our uh, director of strategic operations, the executive director of strategic operations, uh, Ms. Emily Cox is going to share with us um, her deep dive. And I want to take time uh, to share appreciation to her and uh, Sarah Linehan uh, and Charles Blake who are playing a role in the process. Uh, and they've been spending, and particularly I know um, Sarah Linehan and uh, Mrs. Cox have been spending a lot of time on a number of different webinars, whether it's U.S. Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities, Arkansas Municipal League, uh, GFOA, uh, which is Governor, Government um, Finance, um, I can't understand. Officers. Um, Officers Association. Um, and so uh, they spent a lot of time to get us to this point. I do want to stress uh, with members of the board, there are still uh, some unanswered questions and a good example of that is uh, the federal government having a final interim rule, <laughs> which I've never heard of before. Uh, but that being said, uh, the goal today is one uh, is to share uh, what exactly it, uh, is the American Rescue Plan, its intent, 
uh, the compliance uh, and something that we have to pay uh, special attention to uh, because any misuse or misappropriation of funds uh, for unintended use or lack of having a good understanding of the use uh, results in not only a flagging uh, of federal issues from a compliance standpoint, but a recouping of funds. Uh, so we have to be very um, particular on how we spend these funds in a very intentful way. And so I want to start there uh, and then we'll kind of set the stage for other things. But again, the goal is to share what exactly what, uh, is the American Rescue Plan and its intent. Uh, and uh, as you're aware, uh, myself and Mr. Moore will provide recommendations. Uh, I've visited with majority of the board uh, individually uh, before we've gotten here today just to kind of get some initial thoughts. One of the, except for a few uh, members that have spent some time uh, on some webinars, I know uh, Director Webb has and just in some her other life uh, she, uh, has access to or working with other organizations that may have access to American Rescue Plan dollars. So she's pretty familiar uh, as well as Director Compiris has been looking, doing some research as well. So and Director Phillips. So uh, that being said, I know there's always some general knowledge, but we want to kind of do a deep dive today. Uh, but uh, myself and Bruce Moore will uh, make some recommendations uh, based on what uh, the plan uh, and what we can use those dollars for, of course, uh, working with the board and ultimately at the end of the day, uh, uh, the board has to approve uh, that spending plan uh, of this uh, $38 million. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so with that, uh, Allie, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, so the act was signed in March of this year and um, we did receive the interim final rule on May 10th. And as the mayor mentioned, it is an interim final rule. So we do expect some changes to that. Um, and we are an entitlement city, which does mean that we receive funds directly from US Treasury. So we did get that first half last week, as he mentioned. Um, and then so the, the um, state and local fiscal recovery funds kind of have four big premises, premises to them. Um, first, supporting urgent COVID response efforts to um, decrease the spread of the virus. Secondly, replacing public sector lost revenue to strengthen support for public services. Um, thirdly, um, supporting economic stabilization for households and businesses, and then also addressing systemic public health and economic challenges that have contributed contributed to an unequal impact of the pandemic to certain populations. So if you'll go to the next slide, Allie. Um, and all of this, also the other new piece um, on this slide is that there's no local match required to spend the funds. And also the US Treasury has encouraged partnerships with other governmental entities um, as well. And I wanted to put some of the Arkansas Municipal League said this is a marathon and not a sprint. With the CARES Act, it felt like everything just moved really, really quickly. We had to spend the money yesterday. You know, it was just all very fast. And so the Arkansas Municipal League said, hey, this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. So um, I, I thought that was pretty apt, especially after I dove into the interim final rule. So here's some um, key highlights on that um, that are itemized in the, um, the interim final rule. But basically, you can see that um, the expectation is that most recipients will adapt their plan as the recovery evolves. And I think you saw that with um, the stimulus with the with ARA in 2008, 2009, that um, some of the economic impacts came later. And so this kind of acknowledges that. Um, so they do expect changes over time. So next slide. And with that, here is the timeline. So um, generally speaking, this is a forward looking pot of money. We are used to thinking about FEMA reimbursements for disasters. And so that's obviously you spent it, then you get reimbursed if it's eligible. And here um, it's forward looking. So um, costs could have been incurred as early as March 3rd of this year. Um, and then the costs must be obligated by December 31st of 2024. Um, and so that's a decision on how you spend the funds and that's an almost four year period. Um, and as I said on the previous slide, the feds do expect adaptations to 
to how you spend this over time. And then lastly, projects have to be completed and paid for by December 31st of 2016. So um, that's, that's the timeline. So that's why I'm marathon, not a sprint. Um, and then the Municipal League also, I just cut and paste right from, from a presentation. They said, don't spend the money yet. And they put it in all caps. So I'm sharing that here because the rule's not final. There is more guidance to come. Um, and as the mayor said earlier, funds that are spent improperly will be recouped. And the time frame in which to spend funds is considerably lengthier than for the CARES Act. Um, so now for an overview of the eligible expense categories. So um, just real quickly, and then I'll dive into them. Um, indirect costs are acknowledged in the Rescue Plan Act. Um, expenditure of lost revenue on governmental services, public health measures to address the pandemic, water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, um, addressing negative impacts from uh, negative economic impacts of COVID-19 and also premium pay for certain eligible workers. Um, on indirect costs, um, will, uh, the federal government will assign a percentage of funds that is allowable for indirect costs. So that's the first. And then second, um, on revenue loss. So this, um, the final rule will include a formula for calculating annual revenue loss. And it's truly, it is a formula. Um, I think so far it's about, in the interim final rule, it's about 10 pages or so at least. Um, and they do expect that to change. So we cannot tell you what our annual revenue loss number is according to the formula yet. Um, but I do know that they'll be using a base year of 2019. And then also throughout this marathon, we have different opportunities to calculate our revenue loss for each year of the, of the four years. So um, when we get the final rule, we'll be able to calculate FY20's revenue loss, and then you do the same thing each year. So for FY2021, you do it at the end and so forth. Um, so this recognizes, this is a recognition that um, impacts to revenue might happen later on in the pandemic. So, um, and then just as a reminder, so we can calculate our revenue loss for each year for four different years. And so the last time we'll do that is on December 31st of 2023. And then we have until, we have a whole other calendar year until December 31st of 24 to obligate projects. And then until December 31st of 26 to complete and pay for those projects. Um, so there, the revenue loss category as, um, as an eligible category, it, it does include some additional flexibility that's not in the other categories. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, so first of all, you can spend up to whatever our revenue loss amount is on any of the eligible categories, plus on government services. And government services are mentioned as maintenance or um, pay as you go funded building of infrastructure, building of infrastructure, which can include roads and facilities, uh, modernization of cybersecurity, health services, environmental remediation, school or education services, and provision of public safety. And then, um, so that's the revenue loss category. And then moving on to the public health measures category. First of all, it has to be in response to COVID-19. Um, and types of eligible uses are mitigation and prevention programs pertaining to COVID, medical expenses, behavioral health care, public health and safety staff. And the way that you can, um, the way you determine that is different from how we did it in the CARES Act. Um, also, expenses to improve the design and execution of public health programs and expenses to address disparities in public health outcomes. So some of the mitigation and prevention um, examples that are um, that Treasury outlines include vaccination programs, medical care, testing, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine support. Um, and then support for vulnerable populations to access medical or public health services, um, support for um, prevention and mitigation in congregate living facilities and schools, ventilation improvements in congregate settings, and enhancement of public health data systems. 
And then uh, lastly, capital investments in public facilities to meet pandemic operational needs like physical plant improvements or adaptations to public buildings to implement COVID-19 mitigation tactics. And then on the public health and safety staff, as I said, this is different from how um, in the CARES Act, we were allowed to have a pre to presume that certain employees spent 100% of their time on COVID related activities. And that presumption is not in place with the American Rescue Plan. So just wanted to point that out. And then um, examples of expenses to address disparities in public health outcomes. There's a lengthy list here. Um, community health workers, public benefits, navigators, um, housing services to support healthy living environments and neighborhoods conducive to mental and physical wellness, remediation of lead paint or other lead hazards, and also evidence-based community violence intervention programs to prevent um, violence that um, and mitigate the increase in violence during the pandemic. And the next category um, is water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And I've broken it up with water and sewer first. Um, and the eligibility here aligns with the EPA's existing programs of um, Clean Water State Revolving Fund and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. And so um, those programs allow for wide ranges of possible projects. And um, including green infrastructure projects that support stormwater system resiliency and that type of thing. And then there's also um, a portion of the guidance that encourages um, strong labor standards and includes a local hire provision. So that's worth noting as well. And then on the broadband infrastructure, um, there are certain adequate internet speed requirements involved. And, um, Unique to this is that it could be provided to unserved and underserved households and businesses, but there are lots of broadband um, pots of money out there at the state and federal level, particularly. So um, we definitely would want to see if anything else out there too on the broadband front. Next slide. Um, and then the next category is addressing negative economic impacts. And so the first thing you have to do is assess whether an expenditure responds to the negative economic impacts of COVID. And so um, in the FAQ that the Treasury issued, general economic development projects that don't directly address a negative impact, negative economic impact of the pandemic don't meet the standard. Um, but possible eligible uses include assistance to unemployed workers like job, job training, um, the state unemployment insurance trust fund, assistance to households, expenses to improve efficacy of economic relief programs, small business and nonprofit assistance, rehiring local government staff, building stronger communities through housing and neighborhood investments, and aid to impacted industries, addressing education disparities and promoting healthy childhood environments. And then on the assistance to households, um, the examples that were provided by Treasury include food assistance, rent, mortgage, or utility assistance, counseling, and legal aid to prevent homelessness or eviction and emergency assistance and internet access. And then um, a note of caution about subawards is that um, transfers and subawards require the city to stand in the shoes of the subawardee. So um, we would be responsible for how any subawardee would spend funds. So it's something we would want to proceed with caution on. Um, and then also um, the constitution of the state of Arkansas also needs to be taken into consideration. So, and then uh, the final eligibility category is premium pay. And that is for eligible workers who have performed essential work during the pandemic. And the work has to be in person on the job site or regular phys or require regular physical handling of items that were also handled by others. So you can see the list of examples there um, for those that might qualify. And then ineligible uses of the funds include um, offsetting a reduction in the net tax revenue. Um, kind of, you know, the federal government here was trying to say don't you know, implement a tax cut 
because you have these funds. Um, so this is kind of their backstop for that. Um, not you cannot deposit into pension funds to reduce an accrued unfunded liability, and the funds cannot be used to meet local match requirements for grants, nor can it be used for debt service. So I have said a lot, and I would be happy to take any questions you have. And also, um, we may not know the answers, but we'll certainly try or get answers to them. Mayor. One second, Director, Director Wright, Vice Mayor Hines. Yes, um, so the big question is, uh, what are we estimating our law, our revenue losses at uh, on this? We, until we know the exact formula. So, Vice Mayor Hines, we don't have that answer yet. Okay. We so that's part of this. Right, that's part of permanent the permanent interim rule. Yes, sir. Exactly. <laughs> and and so uh, and we know that. Uh, Number one, I, what I would think just based on what we know, 2019 was a good year, um, but then 2020 clearly was different. Uh, and so it's kind of hard to compare things from that standpoint. But based on the understanding that we have and, and visiting with both uh, Director Cox and Director Linehan, is that uh, what we ha all have to understand is, and I'll kind of give more of a, a concept. Um, we all understand the concept of Robin Peter to pay Paul. Uh, think of it as um, instead of robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, the revenue replacement has the opportunity to shift uh, Peter's resources to contribute to Paul's resources. Uh, and, and that concept is it then brings a whole nother set of questions. And so that's the reason why uh, myself, Mr. Moore, uh, Mr. Blake, Mr. Um, Mrs. Cox and Ms. Linhan are all be working together because there are different sets of uh, realities from that standpoint. And then two, we also have to pay attention to other uh, uses of it and if it flies in the face of the compliance. So we have to be very, uh, very particular. So that, that's number one. Number two, we probably will not have that answer um, for another 30 days just on that, uh, Vice Mayor Hines. They said 30 days from May 10th, I believe. Um, and so that, that won't be known until then. What I do want to share is just when we're looking at these ineligible uses, because a lot of people, uh, there's always been a lot of commentary that we can use this to backfill, we can't, we can use this to su supplant, uh, and we cannot. This truly is used to supplement or add to various programs that are identified uh, and does not create ongoing uh, expenditures. Uh, and so um, when we think about, and I'll just you know, be candid, even from the rebuild, the, the rock proposal, the sales tax proposal, we've already looked at different things that may or may not qualify and based on all our understanding, none of it does qualify. However, uh, when you think about revenue replacement, there's some room there possibly, but not in, we still have to understand infrastructure. We have about 80 million. We don't have 80 million in the, uh, American Rescue Plan, and if you, we can't contribute all to one thing, uh, and so we got to be very uh, judicious from that standpoint. But we staff has taken time uh, to review what could qualify, what could not qualify, does not create ongoing expenditures. Also, um, our department directors have already sent um, uh, have sent information um, that we are working on uh, to review as uh, draft recommendations. From their point of view, but no decisions have been made and we haven't even gone through it all. Director Wright. Mayor, will there be room for us as directors to make recommendations? Yes, ma'am. Because uh, reading through this, and I have been following it um, online, I see several areas where the targeted community development initiative framework could be implemented using these funds. I totally agree, uh, Director Wright. Um, and, and even a, a tip of the hat to you, uh, there's some things that you've worked on in the past that's a possibility uh, of, that could be done, but also as uh, long as we do not create ongoing expenditures, but there, there's room to send dollars to um, public benefit organizations, uh, other uh, sub-grantees, but as Mrs. Cox shared, uh, we have to 
thoroughly vet uh, those sub grantees because we take responsibility in what they do with those dollars and it could, you know, we got to be very dot all the I's and cross all the T's uh, with the sub grantees from that standpoint. But also uh, when you really look through it, uh, if you've paid attention to things from uh, President Biden, uh, this truly has an equity focus, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, low to moderate income families within the nation, uh, but also um, uh, different things that address disparities and disparate impact. Um, and so that does fall in line with the targeted community development resolution. And my concern, though, is that staff are not, uh, they may be aware of it, but I don't know if they are considering it when they're discussing potential projects and potential ways that could, these funds could be used. But I know in the target areas, uh, we have underserved and we have um, school and education services. And I know maybe not my other colleagues that, were, that worked on that with me, uh, they may not have developed any plans, but I have and uh, submitted those to Mr. Moore in the form of a strategic economic development strategy. And as I shared with you and the board a few weeks ago, I do have private partners that are willing to assist with fundraising. And one in particular is the Outdoor Learning Center. And I've submitted that to Mr. Moore and I believe the park staff is putting together the information that has been requested. So I see where this could assist there as well as uh, there's a greenhouse with that, there's hydroponic garden with that, there's that, that would create seven to 10 jobs, that kind of thing. And we have a housing component in there uh, for affordable housing. So I just would really like for staff to review that resolution if they have not each department to take the targeted community development initiative resolution and review it and look at these dollars from that vantage point to see how uh, they could be used. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I would, because uh, I do know you've worked a lot on different things uh, while I visit with most of the board members about um, uh, asking for recommendations. Clearly, one of the things was they wanted to wait to get some more information uh, from this uh, particular meeting. Uh, please submit that in writing um, uh, to uh, myself and uh, Director Linehan. Uh, well, just send it to myself and Mr. Moore, and we'll, we'll, we'll navigate everything else with staff. And I also want to make sure I kind of really correct the record. Uh, there's nothing final. Uh, staff is working on mm -hmm. uh, recommendations, so there's nothing final uh, from that standpoint. So there's nothing really to share. Well, I understand that. Yeah. I just wanted to, them to use that framework because they may, not, they may not be even thinking along those lines. Yes, ma'am. They'll use that framework as they're preparing things. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Director Webb. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just, I just want to clarify something that... Um, that you said earlier, you said it would be 30 days or approximately 30 days. And is that 30 days when we will find out what the final rules are or till we find out about what our uh, revenue replacement needs are? And I apologize that I didn't hear what that was. Director Tosh can share. I, I, I don't want to speak for her because I. You know. The mayor was referring to it, that the interim final rule should be final in 30, 30 days from issuance. And it was issued on May 10. So then when the rule's final, that will also include the formula for how we must determine revenue loss. So the revenue loss number, we, we, we cannot calculate that until the rule is final, final, final. Hey, um, I think the, the time frame is from the date that it ended up in the Federal Register, and so I think that's June the twentieth instead of June the tenth. Okay. Director Phillips, uh, Mayor, I think Director Hendricks had a hand raised before me. Thank you. I apologize, Director Hendricks. On mute. You're on mute, Director Hendricks. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I said you're gonna get in trouble. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'd like to have a copy of what was read to us. Is that available? 
Yes, yes ma'am. We'll, uh, uh, Mr. Moore, if you can email that to Director Hendricks. Oh, they know, they know how to get it to me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Director Phillips. Th thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Cox, just want to get some clarification. Um, I think we all understand it, but make sure for the public, the revenues, the revenue loss calculation must be done first before we do any other allocations of the American Rescue Plan dollars. Is that correct? That's what I would recommend, just because there's more flexibility in the revenue loss expense category, I guess. So yes. So theoretically, we'll figure out what that number is, replace that revenue, and then the difference is what we would use based on the eligible uses that you just outlined for us. It correct? really depends on exactly what the, um, I would really prefer for Sarah to answer that question, oh, okay. honestly. <laughs> um, but. Director Linehan. So one of the things that's a little bit confusing when they include revenue loss as a category is that the city will not be reimbursed for the calculated revenue loss. That just opens it up to be eligible for expenditure outside those more narrow defined categories that Emily went through. Okay. So for example, infrastructure. Under the plan itself, it's only water, sewer, broadband, no roads but the lost revenue portion can be spent on loads or roads, excuse me, up to the amount of your lost revenue. So that's more flexible than the other infrastructure. I understand that, but we still can't figure that out until we understand what the calculation is for the revenue loss. There's some broad guidelines for the revenue loss, but they're still figuring out what you include and exclude. And so that's where the complicating factors come in. Okay. Thank you. I understand that. Uh, second question to Director Cox. Uh, you mentioned in the uh, PowerPoint that it's encouraged for us to know what other governments are doing. So is there someone, I don't know about at the state level, but at least at the county level that we should talk to to make sure that we're not spending the money in the same fashion or doubling down in that regard? I think we can definitely talk to our partners in the in the county about that. And the last thing, based on my research there, uh, I think they're used the term qualified census tracts. Yes. As it relates to underserved and underserved. Yes. Can you get us when available a copy of what the qualified census tracts are within Little Rock? Yes, I can. I have gotten something that's preliminary, but uh, I'll dive into that and get okay. it for you. Yes. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Director uh, Wyrick, then Director Computers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Doris and I are on the same, same wavelength in regards to targeted communities. You and I had a conversation last week in that regards. One of the areas that uh, will be one of my targeted communities uh, has had a study done by the health department and has a real high rate of respiratory issues. Um, there are economic challenges that are in that area. Um, it's a high crime, high crime rate area. But one of the things that um, when I when I read this statement in here, and it's on the second page, and it says address systemic public health and economic challenges. So um, if I hadn't seen the story on public health in regard to respiratory issues. I would know that there was a health challenge in that community. So how are we as a city gonna know the uh, health challenges for particular areas? Well, that depends on if we make a decision to fund a program. So before anything that we present to the board, we'll make sure, certain that it's well vetted and meets the guidelines of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, the last thing we ever want to do, A, is for the board to approve something that does not meet the guidelines because we all are held accountable by the federal government. Well, I get that, but um, 
how do you know how do you know what this plan is really addressing in regards to public health and economic challenges? What do we have as benchmarks or information to understand? So we have organizations like uh, the Minority Health Commission. We have organizations like Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, uh, UMS College of Public Health. Uh, there are a lot, of, and there are a lot of research organizations that we can get that research and actually do research for a living to provide that information. We actually had a meeting uh, last week with ACI uh, because they they know this is part of the process. So there are a lot of organizations that are engaged. Okay, so we have resources to answer that question if that's one of the things that we we as a board choose to spend the money in yes ma'am okay thank you thank you director computers sheriff an, an easy question there are problems that we have community wise homelessness being the, the easiest one to define when you look at this are we starting to look at this in a holistic pattern with North Little Rock, the county, Sherwood, and everything as we approach these issues? The um, catch organization um, includes lots of it's central Arkansas, and I think um, they'll, they could be part of it and give us recommendations. And I know we also have separate funding for homelessness that's a totally separate fund from these local relief funds that are will be coming through the housing and neighborhood programs department as well. well it doesn't have to just be housing but there there are countywide issues that we yes. all see mm -hmm. and we're all getting funds and there's somebody doing the same thing we're doing in the county and cities around us are we looking at this on the start holistically to see what we can do about pooling our money and making a bigger bang for what we're doing and having money left over to spend for other things. That's. I understand it's definitely on, on my radar screen. Yes, we totally understand that, but. Um, I'd say the best way. Um, each municipality. Uh, whether it's county or respective cities. Um, just like this board is going to have its own ideas on the funding, um, they're going to have their own ideas on the funding. Uh, there was uh, a possibility, uh, for instance, on some economic, just like we work together on economic development projects within um, the county and the city, those are always opportunities. Uh, but when you have the complexity of this, uh, that may, collaboration may be a challenge unless it's uh, for certain things uh, I, I would share with you. I know there's been collaboration between, or at least when, when I say this, I don't want to say it the wrong way. Um, Central Arkansas Waters had some challenges with, uh, there was a conscious decision not to um, take certain payments or allow payments to be paid on time, things of that nature. Placid County was able to receive some funding to help with that utility assistance. That's a collaboration. Uh, that's something you can kind of center on there. It's going to be a challenge. Well, I, I agree with you and, and I think it will be and, and everybody will have their own priorities, but. I'm just asking. efforts efforts being made okay. to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, um, Director Richardson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to follow up on a couple of quick points, I think that Dean. <clears throat> and both Antoine made reference to, um, and uh, and it, it's related to the rental assistance program. I think we have dollars for the city to use. Kevin, is that not correct? And there's dollars that go through the county. I think also some dollars that go through DHS, which was the impetus for us trying to pass a resolution on, on um, a moratorium for renters, uh, eviction of renters. So I think that that's one of the issues, Kevin, I may or may not be fully informed of, Mayor, but I think to answer Dean's and Antoine's question about pooling the resources, making sure we're working in concert rather than conflict with one another, may be a particular issue that we can look at as uh, one source of funding. <clears throat> and to BJ's point about picking out those particular areas, I think that, I think we identified that when we came up with those areas we wanted to target with that funding. I think we looked at some of the social challenges, some of the health challenges, some of the areas that were food deserts. 
financial deserts, some of those areas where we had high childhood obesity rates, we had a number of other risk factors that that laid the foundation for us to choose those areas. I think that we have the resources, we hadn't clearly defined them in terms of dotting the I's across the T's, Mayor, we would be able to do that as much as needed to justify the spending uh, of these funds to help support that targeted development initiative we passed. So I think we have the resources, we have the tools, we have to just make sure we're working in concert with each other rather than conflict with each other. Yes, sir. Totally agree. Um, sure. I don't know if your hands are still Vice Mayor Hines, are your hands still held? Yes. Yes. I was, went back up to. Okay. Thank you. We'll come back. Uh, oh, you, or, you recognize me, Mayor? Yes, sir. Um, and I don't know if this goes to Tom. I got a couple of different deals. Uh, one going back to coordination with Pulaski County. Um, I think we ought to really get a working group together between some staff members, directors, and JPs to really put together where we could think we could work together um, because we've got, you know, the city makes up a majority of Pulaski County for one. Um, there are some areas on our peripheries where we share boundaries with the county and the city that are probably opportunities to work together with them to extend those dollars, not only for us, but for the county. And I think we probably ought to have a, some type of working group with with uh, city directors, JPs, and staff members from both the county and and the and the city. Seems to be a good good idea going forward. Um, Tom, I guess this would be a question for you. Um, to see all the public health stuff in here, which kind of really is out of the city's wheelhouse. I, when I think of public health, I think of the county health department and the state health department that that were kind of out. Uh, the one thing that did chime in here was the violent crime issue as a public health issue. I, I get that, but where are we going to be bound by the Arkansas state constitution? Getting too far off the rails where we're not, you know, we're getting out of our getting out of our sandboxes where public health is concerned because that's really more of the county and the states state level issue. Only read through the hundred and fifty one pages. I'm sure Emily has read it more than that. And the the thrust that I get is that anything of this nature has to be related back to the pandemic. So, um, you know, that that's how you would do it. It's that these are federal dollars given to us. Not going to be mingled with the dollars we have uh, from state or local entities so that we can spend them under federal guidelines and then that way the state constitutional limitation doesn't apply. Thank you. Director Wright. Um, Mayor, I want to uh, go backwards to something she said about infrastructure. Um, I understood what Sarah said, something about once we determine uh, that calculation then possibly we could use some of the money towards some infrastructure. And uh, Mr. Moore, I have a bridge that prohibits walkability to the grocery store. I had previously asked you to uh, set aside some of the Arkansas Highway and Transportation funds that we get from that tax to replace that bridge with a pedestrian bridge. And uh, if there's a possibility, if that is not possible, then I do want that bridge to be considered because it does contribute to the area around 36th Street, John Barrow, being a food desert because there's no walkable grocery store for those people. Wanted to make sure that's on your radar, but when I uh, submit my summary, I'll be sure to include it. Director Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I want to chime in um, and piggyback on what Director Wright and Director Wyrick said about the targeted community development resolution. I know we have a, a commission that's being formed. Um, so I think it would be a good idea for once we get those qualified census tracts uh, from Emily to share with that working group um, so they can form some ideas that may inform us uh, to present to you about how to address some of these equity issues that seem to be the aim of these dollars. Uh, so I, I will make that suggestion for that uh, working group. 
for them to get a copy of those qualified census tracts. Yes, and actually, uh, it's the goal to have their working group named by next Tuesday. I think I now have a majority of the uh, consulted with members of the work of the those identified um, board members and consulted, and we'll be making those appointments. Uh, the goal is to make those appointments by Tuesday. Uh, so thank you for that. And so once we get that, we'll be able to get that uh, information to them as well as the members of the board. Um, Secondly, uh, one of the things, if every board member, uh, if you have a recommendation, uh, and, and we're not, we don't expect, uh, that's the reason why we have a staff, we don't expect you to have um, a comprehensive recommendation. We can take the time to do that research. As a great example, what uh, Director Warwick was sharing, um, and kind of bird dog it from that standpoint, if every board member uh, can email me uh, the recommendations by June uh, the second. I believe that's Monday. I mean, two is June the second. What's next Tuesday? June first. June second. So by June the first, if every board member can email me, uh, and I'll get that to um, Sarah, Emily, um, and Mr. Moore and Mr. Blake, who are all working on that. Um, so if you could all email that to me on June the first. Second, uh, this some just I probably should have shared earlier. Um, the county mayors, uh, we meet biweekly, and so this is actually one of the discussion topics that we have on our calendar. And uh, so, that coordination there uh, will come from that standpoint. I'll be able to report back just anything that they're thinking about. So we already had that's been going on since uh, COVID nineteen. We created a COVID nineteen county uh, county mayor meeting. Uh, and so uh, it's now transitioned just to focus on better collaboration amongst the uh, cities within Pulaski County. So we'll share that once we get more information there. Also, I uh, want to share because it wasn't mentioned just for information. Um, housing neighborhood programs is getting somewhere around 2.67 million specifically for uh, residents experiencing homelessness uh, as well. The state, I believe, got 1.3 billion, 1.7 billion. Um, but at least a billion dollars uh, that they have their own discretion on and things of that nature uh, from that standpoint. So just wanted to share that. Director Webb. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. I thought of one more question. It may be for uh, Emily, but I've gone to a couple of the webinars and I think you and I have talked about it a little bit, how there are a lot of grants that are also available in this. And some of the things that some of the other directors have talked about, like, um, and you just mentioned the county ma uh, county mayor's group, and some t I've talked to the county judge and some others about maybe going after uh, something for for additional funds for homelessness that we might have an opportunity. So when the staff and and y'all are making these recommendations, are you also looking at some of those grants and thinking about? Uh, some of those opportunities that we might have to get even additional funds over this 37 million. Uh, yes, we are. And Sarah may be able to speak more to that from the grants division, but in my conversations, yes. Thank you. We're looking at how we fully leverage everything with these dollars. But there are also, there are also as Sarah was share with you directly on hand and was share, we got to be very cautious in leveraging those dollars as well. And we are looking at other opportunities because we want to make sure that um, if, if a need fits in a more restrictive grant that we're using those funds first so that, you know, when we have additional flexibility with other funds that that's available. But we also have to be very cautious because one of the specific guidelines is that this is not to be used as grant match because it is from the federal government to begin with. So it's kind of double counting if you also use it as match. So we've got to be cautious about that as well. Any more questions in regards to the American Rescue Plan? I think my hand is still up, Mayor. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to dovetail your point about the recommendations from us with respect to how we move forward. And I would challenge all of us to look at these recommendations as issues 
rather than particular projects for specific wars, so we don't get it the notion that we're playing war politics. So, for instance, homelessness is an issue that cuts across. We know hunger, uh, we know crime, we know there's a lot of issues that cut across the board in respect to this whole city. So I'd encourage us, Mayor, I know you don't want me to say this for you, for us to make these recommendations centered around issues rather than particular projects in, in specific wars. Reentry is a, is a real important issue um, from my standpoint. I think us getting people employed or unemployed or unemployable back into the mainstream um, employment market so they can quit um, committing some of these uh, silly, idiotic criminal activities that we have to suffer from. So I think with respect to your challenge to us, I would like to challenge us to look at these as issue-wise rather than particular projects in any specific award. All right, thank you so much. So I think, uh, Mr. Moore, for our kind of follow-up items, uh, uh, City Board is going to send out those recommendations, and I'll, I'll to me, and I'll funnel those uh, to the team by June the first. Uh, Director Cox, you will send out the qualified census tracts um, to help with the targeted community development, and then it's the goal to name the targeted community development working group um, by. June the 1st as well. Director Richardson, you have another question? Yes, are we finished with that, Mayor? I have, I have one other issue before we get into the policy discussion. Sure thing. Uh, and then we'll we'll have a brief recess before we go to the next policy discussion. Okay. Uh, Bruce, um, May 25th, the exact date, 2012, we had a memo from you about a citizen complaint with respect to take-home cars particularly our police cars uh, outside the city of Little Rock. And Mayor, you weren't on board at the time, and Chief, you wasn't on board at the time. But I would like for us to develop a comprehensive policy with respect to police take-home cars, because we know that they have some kind of financial impact on our, our budget. I don't know how we quantify maintenance or replacement of vehicles, but I know we certainly can quantify gas uses and the amount we're spending on gas, but we had uh, a memo from you, Bruce, on this day nine years ago um, about a citizen who had complained about sending our police department cars outside of the city limits. And I think at the time we we're going to develop a comprehensive policy and the procedures and guidelines to address this issue. And if I missed it, I apologize. If we haven't, I encourage us to do that. And Mr. Moore, if you need this memo uh, for your reference, I can get this back to you. But Mayor and Bruce and Chief, I would encourage us to develop a comprehensive take on car policy for our police department because we have far too many of them, I think, leaving our city on a daily basis. It's having an impact on our on our on our budget. Yes, sir. We'll have a brief recess. Uh or uh, it's five fourteen. We'll we'll come back at five twenty. to go yesterday and get my chicken. And I'm, I'm wondering when we just...
We're now back in session. I uh, know we have a few board members still um, coming back to the seating area, but wanted to get us, keep us on track on time as best as possible uh, with knowing that we always spend as much time as needed. Um, as we all are aware, um, uh, we have the uh, rebuild the rock sales tax proposal on this particular policy agenda item to continue to discuss that agenda item. Um, it, it was motioned to be tabled a couple weeks ago or a week or so ago. Uh, since that time, have met with uh, various board members with, uh, to discuss various different things, and we felt the need to have a, a continued discussion uh, and the ability to answer uh, some questions we have. Uh, department directors here who are available if, uh, if it's a question that myself or Mr. Moore can't answer uh, to ensure that we have thorough opportunity to uh, respond to questions uh, as we move forward. Are there any questions? <laughs> oh, Director Webb, I see your hand now. Sorry, I couldn't find my hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for putting this on the agenda today and for the opportunity. I do have a few questions and they're uh, based on some of the things that constituents have asked. And I also appreciate the time that you and Manager Moore and I have had to talk about some of the questions. But I think it would be helpful uh, for me to be a little repetitive with a couple of things so people out who are watching uh, can hear the answers to these. And so, uh, like I said, I've got a few, but if, I'll just go ahead and, and jump into it. One of the things that uh, somebody raised that is not directly about the tax plan, and I'm gonna direct this to manager Moore, but it was, uh, I thought, related and a little bit unfair because we've discussed it before and people have asked about why do we provide services to Camac Village and why do we provide services to some of the other places and if we charged more for that then we wouldn't need money so it is related and the last time uh, Mr. Moore sent me a memo on this was maybe I don't know a year ago or so but Bruce would you mind addressing that if I'm not catching you off guard because I think what you told me was that we are charging a fair rate and so uh, I just think it's good to clarify that and then then I would like to ask a couple more if that's okay yes ma'am uh yes director Webb I think director Adcock and others have raised this issue over the years we do have a, an agreement with KMAC uh village um and the, the the one thing that is important to to note um, is we have a um, uh, we have we have to provide service when needed. So um, and it, it's referred to as mutual aid, and uh, and they really and, and Tom's opined on this some time before that in some instances we're not even sure we can charge, but. Uh, we do have an agreement uh, with uh, KMAC Village uh, that um, allows us to provide fire service and, and some limited dispatch uh, in, in that community. But, it, but again, uh, if we didn't have that agreement in place, we would still have to provide that service if needed or if requested. Um, one of the and it is at a reasonable amount. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to go back and look. Uh, we we did negotiate it and brought it to the board, but I, I can I can provide that the, the actual amount we charge. But uh, we don't respond a lot. Uh, we when you look at uh, you know our response rate, uh, we don't really have to respond a lot over there. We just have it in place <laughs> as a fail safety, basically. Thank you. One of the questions we talked about. Um, but grants to neighborhood, different neighborhoods around the city that would be in addition to the Love Your Block grant. And I can't remember the price tag. I think it was a $5 million 
or $500,000 a year, something like that. And this would be a little bit larger than those love your block grants. And we've had some conversations about this, but we've uh, talked about it in different ways when we've had the conversations. Could one of y'all or a department head clarify sort of where we are? Because I, I do think that neighborhoods would be excited about that opportunity. Right, and I don't know if we can pull uh, Wendell the presentation, but I'll kind of go from memory, uh, the Rebuild the Rock presentation, um, which is online. And, and if we can't, um, we'll figure it out. But long story short, uh, what it has outlined is, as you are correct, the 500,000 a year, and that's it's the Neighborhood Empowerment um, Capacity Fund, uh, which is, uh, focused on micro grants for neighborhood associate competitive micro grants from neighborhood associations and community led organizations uh, to focus on uh, the betterment of those particular neighborhoods uh, where those particular neighborhoods could identify funds um, like the community garden um, that we've been seeing a lot go along uh, to apply for different capacity funds from that standpoint. That's one example, not the only example. Uh, but another example is is having a greater amount rather than the thousand dollars that go to your love your neighborhood, but it would be somewhere between uh, depending on the program and we'll have set parameters in place if uh, the sales tax is passed uh, to be somewhere between um, uh, five thousand to ten thousand dollars is for that amount. So out of we don't expect all, and, and Director Adcock may be able to share, I think we have 189 or 90. 199. 199. We don't expect all 199 to apply. We don't see uh, 199 apply for your Love Your Block grants, but it helps take it to a next level um, rather than $1,000 per neighborhood. And in those parameters, would we have it? So, like, if you got one one year that you wouldn't, you might not be eligible again? Yes, ma'am. In the uh, when we when we talked about the zoo, uh, I think one of the last times we talked about the a uh, cut to some of the zoo funding, one of the potential cuts was in operations. Yet, I think in the past when we've looked at the zoo, that was an area where they might need that ongoing support. So would further discussion about that uh, with the director, uh, Susan Altrui and others be something that could still be on the table. So we didn't, if we did make a cut, we wouldn't cut what we were gonna pro propose for them in the wrong place. Mr. Moore, if you will, uh, I know you've been intimately involved and I, I don't see Director Altrui, uh, but if you would just kind of give a concept. Um, I think to answer Director Webb's question, uh, the mayor said pretty much, you know, everything's on the table. So I think that's the first answer, but uh, this as it currently is, uh, is proposed would add a, a million dollars a year uh, to the zoo's operating budget. Uh, the other thing that uh, we do know is that um, the exhibits that are planned uh, won't, because this is a pay-as-you-go unless we do some short-term financing, the exhibits that we are planning uh, won't happen the first year, the second year, uh, and we're going to have to develop a plan of action on how we build those. But uh, so that is going to allow the, uh, but the operational expense, uh, the million dollars a year will start. Uh, so they will be able to address some of those operational issues. Uh, and the main one is accreditation. Um, we're up for reaccreditation uh, next year. Uh, and uh, it's very critical that those areas that we need to address from accreditation standpoint be addressed. Both, both from an operational and a capital standpoint. So I, I think the answer to your question is yes, we're still continuing to look at that. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, just two more questions. Uh, one of the things that we talked about, we've talked about it in here, uh, Dr. Barth has made 
a couple of presentations and at your suggestion, I called um, our friend uh, over at DHS the other day and had a very positive conversation with her. I continue to get a lot of questions from constituents about the program. And I just, uh, I mean, there are a lot of studies out that show many benefits to it. But one thing that I couldn't answer for some folks, and I hope that maybe Dr. Barth could, would be an example, if there are examples of what, of other cities who may have done this. Um, as you know, I went to San Antonio and looked at their program, but it's for the a little higher age group. And I know Dr. Barth went places before the pandemic and also looked at other programs. And so I don't know if that's some information he has right at his fingertips, but. Dr. Barth. Yeah, and, and uh, Director Comparison, I've been talking about back and forth in, on this exact issue the last couple of days. And there, there really are a variety of cities of different sizes. I mean, and, and some of them would be places that you might expect, like San Francisco, which did theirs very early. Uh, but over time, we've seen cities of really varied sizes really take that on. I can send you a list of, of those cities and where they've got their, gotten their funding. Uh, but, um, but you're right, the, the data is really clear in terms of the, 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 the impact, the positive impact on those uh, young people who are able, whose families take advantage of those programs. Uh, they have really powerful impact, just as we know that the pre-K programs, three and four-year-old programs have positive impact as well. Impact's even better at the, at the zero to two stage. Now, some families are, I think, hesitant at, with infants and toddlers for them to leave the home. I think we have to really um, uh, send very strong messages to parents that this is good for their children and that their kids will be taken care of and will be safe. And that's why it's really important that these be high quality providers with well-trained workers and with uh, educator to student ratios that are really low. And that is exactly what we need to do. But the answer is yes, a lot of, a lot of cities, lots of variety there. Some small programs are really small. Some programs are really big, like San Francisco's, but and some have been around for a long time. Some of them are are newer. Um, I, so I think that's the the, the big answer there. Um, so did that does that get you there? And, and, and I, I and I will send you that that list of of uh, of all of them. I've got a a flurry of things. And what we are also starting to see, because those programs are starting to get a little bit older, we're starting to get some good research on the on the impact. I will say one final thing, uh, Director Webb, is that Arkansas does have a unique program uh, uh, situation in terms of its really clear requirement that for for uh, for funds to be kind of vouchers to be moved from the state uh, to families, these have to be two and three star uh, providers. And that's what I think is some of the most important thing about this program is that we have money in there for technical assistance and for job training to really ratchet up the quality of those providers, make them more sustainable businesses, and make those careers in early childhood education more viable long-term careers rather than short-term stays in that. And that really is what I think pays off powerfully for, uh, for families. Um, thank you. If you could send that, I would appreciate it. And, I, and if I can ask you a follow up on that, one of the uh, the things that you said and that we've talked about is that Arkansas does have a really good pre K program. And folks have asked me why 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 not the state? Why isn't the state doing this? They should be doing this. And I think as some folks who weren't tuned in to the discussions early on when we started talking about this. I would like for you to answer that so folks who are just now mm -hmm. starting to get engaged could hear the answer to that, if you will. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to have a, a big history lesson here, but, but, you know, the state's clear involvement, as you well know, has really been from K through 12. And the early childhood space has been a space where uh, I think that that the states have done some, um, the feds, the federal government has done some, and localities have done some. It's really one of those great examples of different entities really working together. And what I am really proud of about this proposal is that it really is an explicit partnership uh, between a 
good, effective state program that gets some federal funds with uh, some city money that will be ensure that Little Rock residents, especially those residents that need this, this, these services the most, will get them. And so I think there is, um, you know, until a couple of decades ago, we didn't do this at all in terms of providing funding for these programs. And as we have begun to do that, different levels of government have engaged in different ways. And when it works really well, it, it's, it's through a partnership that's sustained and ongoing. And it means that those providers are going to be uh, there year in, year out. Thank you. And I do have a follow up on from the first question. So for um, police dispatch, it's $13,000 annually. And for fire dispatch, it's $10,000 annu annually uh, to KMAC Village. You want to restate that just so people can sure. write that uh, down? Sure. Director, we've had a question about the cost of the, and again, this is a dispatch that we're already providing. Um, but uh, for the police dispatch, uh, and most of y'all know that we have two separate police and fire, but for police it's $13,000 annually and for fire it's $10,000 annually. That yeah. they pay us. That's what I was going to That's what. Yeah, that okay. they pay us. I'm sorry. And Mr. Moore, uh, thank you for that. And I don't remember the last statistic, but if I do remember correctly, there were not a huge number of calls for either one. Is correct. that correct? That's correct. <laughs> At the risk of pushing it, can I ask one more? Always, Director Will. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question about the uh, infrastructure piece, this, particularly the strategic infrastructure piece, because as you know, and as uh, Director Honeywell well knows uh, flooding is a huge issue in Ward 3 and in other wards as well. And until about six months ago, every time we had a really hard rain, I would know everybody who was going to text me and everybody who was going to call me. And over the course of the last six months, not only have all of those folks called me, but I've started to get a lot of new calls from people that I had never heard from before. And last week we got a document that I believe that the strategic infrastructure stakeholders group, I'm not sure if that's the correct title of the group, but they're looking at, and one of the pieces of that is uh, ranking things. So as projects come forward, um, some of the, the projects will be weighted in a certain way. And uh, the representative from Ward 3 had some questions for me that I could not answer very well. Uh, flooding was not, it appeared that flooding was not as high on the list of priorities when we would vote on what these projects were. And if I want, the whole presentation was like 60 something pages and so i've only skimmed admittedly not all of it but i wondered if director honeywell might be able to explain that a little bit better uh, since flooding is a safety concern which is the number one ranked uh, problem if i'm not mistaken director honeywell and the short answer, flooding is a major priority uh, under the sales tax proposal within the strategic infrastructure improvement. But Director Honeywell, if you'll explain, and for everyone to understand what Director, and for the community, um, she's referring to an infrastructure study group that has been going on uh, since the summer of 2019 um, with Garver engineers and community stakeholders, separate and apart from uh, the sales tax proposal. It could help. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Webb, the current project that we're undertaking uh, is developing a set of criteria and a grading system that uh, staff will use to help prioritize projects uh, that we're going to consider for uh, capital funding that we'll have in the future. Uh, as part of that, uh, organizing this program, uh, we have a group of stakeholders that have been helping us uh, develop the 
uh, criteria or indicators that we're going to use to help grade these projects as far as their priorities concerned. Uh, so we asked this group to uh, provide us uh, with subjects they felt were important as these indicators. Those range from safety, like you mentioned, flooding, economic impacts, equity, uh, environmental implications. There's a list of 12 indicators that, that we came up with. Uh, and then as part of this, this group's work, uh, we asked them to go in and rank each of those 12 indicators by their their own opinion of what their importance is from, I guess, one to 12. Uh, we then used those indicator rankings from that group to come up with this uh, weighted scoring structure uh, that you were referring to where flooding uh, has a weight of 7.0, where safety being the number one selected uh, item has a, a weighted uh, indicator of 10. Uh, so what that means is if the score that you get for safety is multiplied by 10, whereas the score that you get for flooding is multiplied by seven, when you're doing the aggregate score for a total project, each project that we look at has a grade or a number for each indicator and each indicator has a weight associated with it. So you have the grade for that indicator multiplied by the weight and then you get a total score for a project. So because a project could be a flooding project, but it could also have safety implications. It could also have economic implications. So all of those factors get included into the overall project score. So we're not saying a flooding project only gets, it's only considered as flooding. It has all those other indicators uh, graded for it as well. Now, that being said, this is a draft version of this uh, plan. Uh, we just showed this, like you said, last week to everybody for the first time last Tuesday. Uh, I believe we emailed all of the members of, bo of the board a copy of, of this presentation. And in that email, there was a link in there that once y'all had an opportunity to look at this, if you had questions or comments, uh, you could use that link to provide us with those comments. I'll definitely take yours back and we'll, we'll discuss this. And there were some other uh, comments that were brought up during the meeting last week that we're working on. But if any of y'all have any other comments about how we have the structure at this point, we're, we're more than happy to hear those go over them, discuss them, and see if anything needs to be adjusted as far as this is concerned. This is definitely not the, the final version of this. We're still working on it. It's a pretty complex thing to put together. So getting y'all's feedback is something we definitely want on how uh, this is being set up at this time, because this is what we would like to use in the future when we're looking at projects and trying to decide which one's got the potential to be funded where another one may not be funded. Thank you. You're welcome. That's helpful. I mean, because I've looked at all the dollars in the street resurfacing, and while that's a huge issue too, uh, I have added up all the dollars that we've requested in drainage projects, and it is a massive number. Yes, ma'am. And I'll defer to others who have their hands up. All right. I think we have uh, one second, we gotta go in order. I know, but I just wanna tell you something. Uh, my screen is dying, so I can't I can't talk to you until y'all wanna speak. Okay. So Here is, uh, or will you accept my hand when I raise it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Put All me right. flying somewhere. All I'm, right. I'm I, about to die here, I'm 10%. Yes, ma'am. I'm plugged in. Direct, yes, ma'am, direct to ACCOP. Yes. This does not have enough infrastructure money in it for me. Uh, BJ and I, Director Wyrick and I, was visiting a home in Meadowcliff the other day. It's approximately 15 feet from the entrance to Hyman Park. And what the lady was wanting to know is there was four houses flooding. We was out there in 2017, and they was having the beginning of flooding. Now, every time it rains, four houses are flooding. And this woman wants to know why we're spending all this money on Hyman when the house is within 10 feet outside the gate is flooding and we've not done anything about it in five years. I hear from neighborhood people, they want a neighborhood study. Last week uh, was Neighborhood USA conference and we had uh, lots of citizens sitting and watching all the workshops being done in Fort Worth. And one of the questions was, why do all these other cities have these big elaborate neighborhood uh, projects going on and we don't seem to have except our thousand dollars and then you only get one uh, 28 neighborhoods get a thousand dollars 
and why do other cities have all these large projects in their neighborhoods? And I would like to see more in our neighborhoods. I'd like to see more infrastructure money because when homes are flooding and it's really hard to stand there and talk to people that's homes are flooding every time it rains now and you want a tax to put more trails in Hyman Park and they want to know why can you not fix their flooding? So to me, it's infrastructure, it's neighborhood issues, it's developing a neighborhood study to say, what do our neighborhoods want? And then to go from there. They're the people we're asking to vote for this and they should have input into it. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Vice Mayor Hines, no, Director Wyrick, I wanna go since we're here. Is that so, okay, Director Hines? Thank you. I, I just wanted to jump in on Kathy's comments or Director Webb's comments on the waiting. Uh, flooding is, is weighted as set a seven behind uh, bike and pedestrian traffic, um, reduced maintenance, congestion, reduction, economic development, and safety. And I think it needs to be weighted closer to the top. Um, Maybe the people that are we're doing the waiting are analyzing it and not been involved in flooding in their neighborhoods or aware that we have such a big problem with flooding. So, um, Kathy, thank you for bringing that up because I, I agree that I think the seven is a little low for flooding because it to me, it's a safety thing. You can't you're not supposed to drive through streets that have water on them and uh, Typically, if there's uh, water on the streets, there's water in the homes, and that's a serious problem. So that's the only comment I wanted to make. Thank you for putting up with me. Always love being around you. I'm, uh, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So. Did, did you have another question? Are oh, you your powers coming back? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Director Honeywell, if you'll just note that, Ted, I know. He, uh, Vice Mayor Hines. Thank you. Uh, since Director Altru is not here, I, I think the, the biggest question when I posed a, a cut to the capital side and in keeping the operating, and I, and I agree with Director Webb and Bruce, uh, I, I just don't feel comfortable cutting their operating fund. That seems to be the constant thing we've heard since I've been on this board. And, and if, if the zoo can't go out and raise matching funds for capital, my question to Director Altru was, is, and hopefully she'll give me an answer, is how much money can you raise based on a match we give you? Uh, you know, I, I really felt that there, there was, uh, her being the former development director, she'd have a pretty good bead if we gave them 12 million, how much could they raise on top of that? Um, the other thing I, I find concerning, Bruce, that you bring up is that those, pro those, those capital projects, which uh, everything I've heard from the zoo foundation and the zoo folks, those drive attendance at the zoo. The fact that we wouldn't be able to implement those immediately raises a concern if we even need them as capital projects that that's that, that that even throws up a bigger red flag if we're coming up on accreditation i, I want to give them money for where we always continue to be shortfalling and part of it's because our personnel cost is out raising is outpacing our uh our sales tax revenue and, and we're so we're on a downward spiral even if even if we did get it passed we, we can't keep up with our personnel cost at the city and so we're back in the same boat 10 years later no, and I and I agree. We we have to address those capital accreditation items. But and and, and I and I've noted as as you are aware, uh, what we did in the last ten years, we we did move some projects up uh, through short term financing and 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 I would suggest that the mayor and I have talked and Sarah and I have talked about this too that well, that will happen again this time because there there will be some needs. Uh, that are just a priority needs. What we did in 2011 and, and uh, like the next 10 years was we really focused on the public safety projects first. Uh, but uh, sales tax is pay as you go. And if you go out and borrow, I think the, the largest uh, note that we borrowed in the last 10 years is about $18 million, uh, but we got to pay that back. So we, it's, it's all a revenue stream within that five year period. So. I, I, I totally agree with you uh, as far as, and, and I, I think when you say operations was cut, I mean, it, it is an increase of a million dollars. It was more, uh, but uh, it is an increase of a million dollars that uh, and that I think we'll be able to address some of the 
personnel concerns. Uh, but also, I mean, Susan, you're right, uh, has done a good job of uh, developing the foundation. And I, I do believe they have a, a strategy and they, they actually brought a consultant a few years ago to say, you know, what, what's really your capacity as a foundation? It's probably about $5 million a year. Uh, and, and that came out of that, that, that study that uh, we, we've um, put forward. So I, I don't disagree with anything you've said. Uh, and, and I remember, didn't we have a huge gift from a zoo patron that wasn't even in the state several years ago, the 10 or $12 million? I mean, we had a huge donation from a patron that passed away that was very zoo-centric that, right. that they developed. So, you know, it, it seems to me that if we had some funds out there for capital that they could go out nationwide and find matching funds, there's all kinds of zoological foundations that do grant matching. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to... Maybe the other thing I'm going to reiterate is, you know, to a T, my constituents, the early childhood development's a, a deal killer, period. Uh, and then no sunset on the tax. I, I, I'm, I'm probably a little more hard coded than the rest of my, I'd like to sunset the whole thing on a 10 year deal. I would probably acquiesce if we just sunsetted the capital portion, uh, if we get to some place. But uh, the early childhood development's a deal killer, especially since we're not, you know, and, and not enough funding for, COPP officers. I know you had, you added some, but I don't think it's going to get us near the officers we need on that front. That's just my take on where I'm at on this. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Any more, uh, Director Richardson? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, two quick points. Um, on the first point, uh, John, if I heard you correctly, on the infrastructure group that we had convened, did you say that each person gave their opinion on what was the priority, or did you say it was a set of criteria they were utilizing to determine the priority? For something like I got third you heard you say they gave their opinions. When we were, Director Richardson, when we were establishing the list of indicators that we're using, that group helped us establish those indicators. Then after we had that list of indicators that, that we decided on, we asked them to go in and actually rank all of those in degrees of importance from one through 12. So the highest being one, the lowest being 12. And then we use those rankings from that group to help us determine the weighted uh, score for each indicator that we'd use to multiply. But that's how we came with the indicators. I mean, that's how we the came. indicators were from staff that are on the, in the stakeholder group and the, the members of the group. We discussed that in the very first meeting that we had these are the type of indicators we want and took their input on what we should use as indicators. Thank you. And another thing, Mayor, um, um, like some of my colleagues, I've gotten yays and nays on various aspects of tax. I hadn't written down uh, the numbers to actually say how many are for or against, so I wouldn't take that liberty of saying my constituents are for this or against that, and I would so I disagree with the Honorable Estimable Director Adcock in that I would challenge us to find any city that puts five and a half million dollars a year for programs for children, youth, and families. So I think that that in itself speaks to our commitment to the families and neighborhoods in our community because we're targeting those dollars to some of the neighborhoods are suffering from most of the social ills. Some of the young people are suffering from most of the social ills and some of the families. So. I think from that respect, we are doing a lot more in terms of neighborhood targeting than a lot of our, our other counterparts in other municipalities with respect to committing funding to help improve outcomes for children, youth, and families. So that's all I want to have to say on that, Mayor. I, I commend you and Bruce and the work you guys have done. There's certainly some room for improvement and work that needs to be done. And certainly, I hope we can collectively come together and, and come up with something that's going to be suitable for all of us and for our citizens as well. Thank you so much, Director Richardson. Director Wright. Mayor, this is for Mr. Honeywell. And it's regarding the weights that are being used. I've been quite disturbed about the fact that bicycle lanes and so forth are weighted higher than flooding and neighborhood streets. And I, I've shared this with the uh, working group of uh, stakeholders and I've shared it with the mayor that I do not feel that our neighborhood streets will ever uh, rise to the top as far as 
uh, being selected for projects. And the only way, and even at the last meeting that I attended, which was a Zoom meeting, the only way I see that neighborhood streets are going to have a chance to get done is if, if there's a separate allocation for them. Because as, as far as this metrics is concerned, it's never going to have uh, the traffic count, it's never gonna have uh, uh, the usage or impact as far as the people are concerned, you know, and, and the only thing I can think of is, is streets that I know in Ward 6 or in any ward that need uh, improvement, that got ditches and, and never have been built, and they're not going to have a lot of cars. So the, the, the traffic count is never going to match this metric or, or have let it rise to the top. And the number of people that live on that street are going to be few. So it's, it's not going to impact uh, the majority of the people that say a Bowman or a Canis would or a Shackelford would, but it's a neighborhood street and people, the people we're asking to, to vote for this live on those streets. And I'm, I've just not seen how this is going to be addressed in the framework of this, this metrics that, that and with the weights that I have been uh, viewing. And the last thing I heard from Garber was that they're still trying to wrap their head around how they can uh, uh, have those streets compete. Because right now they're not going to compete. And I agree with you. And Thank that, you. That's one of the things that we are working on with this system. And that's something that we knew from the beginning with this system. Uh, you may have to have separated funding criteria for certain uh, classifications or sizes of projects in order to make this matrix work. Mm -hmm. You can still use this matrix with residential neighborhood streets to say, do I want to do this neighborhood street or this neighborhood street? They're fair that way. But if you're looking at something that's a huge uh, two mile long arterial street that has tremendous benefit economically, uh, socially and other ways compared to two blocks of a residential street. Yes, I agree. Those are not going to have the same grade when you look at them. So that's one of the things we're looking at uh, when it comes to how funding is done. Do we need to separate out to be able to address those? Or do you look at whole neighborhoods versus just one individual block of a street when you're grading something uh, where you have a bigger expanse of potential impact that would help boost that grade when it comes to residential streets. So that, those are the things we're looking at right now to try to decide what's the best way to try and approach that through this system. But yes, we, 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 we saw that when we started putting this together. Thank you. You're I welcome. appreciate it. And Mayor, I have one final comment um, regarding the uh, early childhood. Uh, my constituents have asked the question, if we're paying a permanent tax already to address our children, youth, and families. Would not zero to two fall into that category and be captured along with our youth master plan or within that youth master plan, plan framework? And with that being the case, why are we asking our citizens to pay a separate permanent tax along with and the, uh, on top of a permanent tax that we are already paying. And so I'm getting a lot of negative feedback with regards to that. And uh, I've had some questions about uh, the Olympic size pool at, I, I think it's Jim Daly or War Memorial, where we already have two pools. And then in our neighborhoods, we don't have anything. And uh, a case in point, someone asked me about the Thrasher Boys Club, and I couldn't tell them anything. I don't know if it's open or, or anything, but uh, there just didn't seem to be a lot of emphasis on neighborhood uh, rebuilding. There was more flash, there was more entertainment, and I'm and I'm I don't mind entertainment, but uh, the people that have been talking to me are very concerned that they are being overtaxed, and uh, it just seemed unfair to come forward with a separate permanent tax on top of a permanent tax to deal with children, youth and families or children period. That's all I have, everybody. Yes, ma'am. And um, 
just a couple things. Thrasher's Boys Club is, uh, to my knowledge, is, is not a city-owned facility. It's a part of the, so that's the reason why there's no funding. Now there has been that there's been times historically where the city has, when they had the availability, uh, help prop up uh, the Boys Club system, uh, but that is not a ongoing expenditure of the city is not something that the city owns and <laughs> mr moore and i believe even director computers uh, could probably speak a little bit more eloquently about that but just one for the record thrashers boys club is not a city-owned facility um in regards to the uh community programs uh, and again from a historical standpoint mr moore please chime in um those dollars uh, as well as director richardson those dollars are specifically for prevention intervention and treatment um and and would not fall in line with the with the spear and the spirit of that policy and what the voters voted for back in the early 90s sounds like i'm somewhat correct i don't hear director richardson is that correct no i i yeah i was just making that that comment in reference to us taking care of looking at neighborhoods uh, comprehensively as uh, one of my colleagues made reference to. And I can't speak on the partnerships with the girls and boys clubs because back when we established the gang intervention program, they were located in neighborhoods where we had the highest uh, gang activity. And coincidentally, there haven't been some boys clubs in those areas. So we used to have gang intervention programs at, at Thrasher, at Whetstone, and at Billy Mitchell. So we've had partnership with them. We didn't own the facilities, but we provided funding for operation of programming out of that to help support those young people in those areas. So I understand what, what you're saying about the the sales tax part. I mean, I just want to just correct uh, one of my colleagues of my opinion about how we address our community as a whole with respect to funding and how we um, um, put funding into our communities. And one thing I always find somewhat interesting Whenever we talk about education specifically, and as a proud graduate of the greatest high school in the world, Central <laughs> High School, I should have been stopped at the greatest in the world. Technical difficulty. Hill to the old Director Hines, Vice Mayor Hines would agree. Uh, uh, Both right. Well, I, I would say this that, you know, I, um, it's interesting how we approach education. I must say this um, because. The state's rationale for taking over our, our school district was we had six out of 48 schools underperforming, I think was the number. So I think 42 out of 48 is 87.7, 87.5%, which is a B plus in my mind. I'm still having reservations about getting over that. But I think the one thing we fail to talk about when we talk about education is we're still using a didactic model that was developing during the Industrial Revolutionary period. And some kids come from real interactive neighborhoods, they get labeled. And I think I made this point last week, there's studies that say some of those black kids get labeled as having behavioral problems. And some of the white kids get labeled as having depression problems, get referred to treatment and mental health services. So I think we need to uh, really take a quick look at how we're still utilizing a didactic, a didactic model that was developed during the industrial revolution. And our, our society is not operating that way. It don't function that way. And even more so today, uh, we have a lot more interaction, a lot more uh, interactive activity. And I think that sometimes that gets a lot of our young people in trouble because they come from those communities that are real interactive and, and they're interactive and they get labeled as having behavioral problems. And I really do think that if we're serious about education, we really need to look at the model and how we're educating and, 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 and engaging young people if we want to move them forward the way we say we do. Thank you so much. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I left my hand up. I need. I want to follow up. There's one other thing that some a constituent sent me that I wanted. She asked me to bring this out yes, if we ever discuss this again, and that was uh, zero to two is essentially daycare, and uh, she said that the state is receiving from the Biden administration, I believe, 29 billion. States are receiving 29 billion uh, for. Uh, early childhood education, which includes daycares, and that Arkansas would get $4 billion out of, of that money as part of our allocation. And so she wanted to know how are we even engaging or getting involved in um, early childhood education when we can't fund our police properly, we can't fix our 
our streets properly. We can't manage our parks and neighborhood uh, parks effectively. And there was one other, and she says, we do not do a good job on economic development, especially in low to moderate income areas and especially in low income areas. So that being said, those are the four pillars that we as a municipal government are called upon by our constituents to address with their tax dollars. So when she sent me the link, I, I, I did not know about this 29 million until she sent me 29 billion, excuse me. And until she sent me that and but apparently it's legitimate funding. And so I don't I know it's not a part of this. It's a separate deal. And I would like to, to, to know if you all are aware of that. And if so, uh, when will that be addressed? Because my constituents are saying no to this early childhood. Before Dr. Barr speaks, the 29 billion is a proposed plan from the Biden administration that has not been passed uh, or even authored a, a bill. It I is, think my, what I saw said it was passed, and it was it, they showed the states. No, I'll send you what I what she sent me. Yes, ma'am. I'm just I'll just it. yeah. It has not been passed. Um, now there are there are some projections on what could be passed if it was passed, but it's not been passed and has not been authored either. Um, from that standpoint, and those dollars are directly towards uh, three to four, not zero to two. Dr. Barr. There, there was um, some zero to two money that was part of the Recovery Act. Um, and uh, but that, of course, just as we talked about earlier with the, the, the city recovery money, it, it's it's times time stamped. And so it will it will go away um, at, at the end of the, the life of that of that Recovery Act. And I think this is the important thing here is that this is this is sustained uh, dollars across across time. Thank that, you so much. That, though, that's the no that I'm getting. Thank you so much. Um, Director uh, Phillips. Uh, Director thank Hines, you. is your hand still up? Yes. Okay. I have one quick question. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I don't have the, the presentation in front of me, but the latest version uh, could you remind me if the latest version included money for the targeted communities development initiative? Yes. And do you what what was that amount? Uh, Five million over the ten year period. Okay. And I bring that up to address a point that um, I, I think Director Adcock brought up about giving more money to our neighborhoods. And I know there's a um, neighborhood grant program. So my understanding is that there is money there. Uh, but if there is a uh, if there's consensus among the board that we need to put more money there, I'm, I'm open to that. Um, but I think, as I mentioned before, uh, if you take somebody, you put somebody on the team, you got to take somebody off the team. And I think I heard someone mention tonight uh, that our personnel costs are not matching our sales tax revenue. But if we're adding additional police officers, that's increasing personnel costs. So if we're concerned about personnel costs, we don't need to add more police officers would be my, my point of view. And my understanding uh, that if if we if we want to put more money towards neighborhoods, I want to make it known that I'm, I'm for that. But we can't it's just not make believe money. We have to move some money from somewhere else. So I, I think that if, if that's a proposal, I'll be supportive of taking some of the money from the COPP officers, which I think has been renamed. I don't think they call them CLPP officers anymore. Is that right, Chief? If Chief's the CRO officers. Um, so that, that would be my uh, point of view as it, as it relates to as it relates to that mayor. So I just wanted to state that. So if we have opportunity to put more money towards neighborhoods, we have to determine where that money is coming from. And my recommendation would be uh, not to add additional officers or personnel to the budget in that regard. Thank you. Director Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think my colleagues have pretty much uh, brought up all the subjects uh, that my uh, constituents have continued to ask me about. And I, I would like to say, I think this is so healthy we're having this discussion. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy and pleased that we tabled it uh, eight to two. So uh, our constituents can, can watch us at work, try to, try to um, 
uh, come to some consensus and collaborate so we can get an election going. Uh, I don't have the presentation in front of me right now either, but uh, speaking of the neighborhood grants that any neighborhood would be eligible for the micro grants, what was the amount on that, Mayor, do you know? We, we gave a general amount, of course, when we have staff, we want to have a, all, all the procedures done. Generally what happens is once we have that funding, the staff will come together and determine that policy. Right, but in, any neighborhood in the city can apply? Yes. Okay, also, um, you've spoken to the education piece, uh, sunset piece. A couple of people have asked me, and I, I know the answer, but I'm asking for them so they can hear it. Um, and I know how old City Hall is, and I know it needs work, but what is the $5 million for City Hall? Because people want to know. Manager Moore. Mayor, members of the board, um, there hadn't been any updates to um, the City Hall facility since the 80s. Um, and uh, there's actually um, a study that was done by Cromwell, um, I mean, probably five, ten years ago. Um, that price tag is over ten million dollars, uh, closer to twenty. Uh, to just to to you know, the building was built in 1906, and um, it just has a lot of uh, issues that need to be addressed at some point. Uh, and this is just not even really a start, but it, it, it will HBAC mean nothing fancy at all. Um, I, I do believe, and, I, and I've said this, um, that we are going to have to address the city boardroom uh, at some point in the new, near future. Uh, I think you know, post COVID, a lot of things have changed. Uh, we don't have to get into it right now, but we're going to have to be out of this uh, facility uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, that's a good thing because it means business is coming back. Uh, but trying to find a location uh, that will accommodate the board, accommodate the technology needs, uh, just because we want to continue to be transparent. Uh, I, I can tell you, I can remember, well, <laughs> if, you know, if this thing isn't shown live uh, at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, uh, somebody thinks something's wrong, and um, and so anyway, that's a long answer to the, just the basic infrastructure needs of the building. Okay, uh, and thank you. And finally, is Chief Hubbard here? Uh, Chief, could I ask you a question? I, I hear you. I don't see. You. There you are. Hi, Chief. So I know we've made some adjustments, uh, and what I'd like to know is it enough? for us to address the needs for the apparatus. R repeat that question, Dora. I, I know we've made some adjustments to the budget for fire and that uh, several of us were concerned about the, the, the aging apparatus okay. and we've made some adjustments and I'd like to know if, if that is sufficient. Uh, I'll defer that question to Willie, our fleet director. Uh, he's been working uh, on this particular plan with fire Okay. as it relates to the ability to replace some of the uh, public safety vehicles. Okay, thank you. You're up. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, that's okay. You can just, you can oh, let I me know. I do know the answer. Uh, 37 and a half million for public safety. Absolutely. You are talking about in yes. the health tax. Yes. Yes, ma'am. That absolutely addresses uh, fire and police uh, with what we got spread it uh, for fire and police over the next. But but especially the aging apparatus that's yes, beyond its uh, so theoretically its very useful life. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, it does. Right. Uh, actually, the mayor got uh, that number from me. So so yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, Mayor. I, I will add, Director. It is a is it a, it is an aggressive uh, replacement plan. Okay, thank you, Chief. Director Hines. Yes, I, I just have one final. Vice Mayor Hines, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just have one uh, final request, Tom. I'd like an official opinion from your office um, based on the. Potential 529 giving plan that's embedded in the uh, mayor's proposal uh, 
on early childhood education, whether or not that's a legal that's that's even legal for us to take tax money and give to individuals. And I'd like an opinion from your office on that so we can put this to bed one time and for all. Thank you. Mayor. Director Wright. And Mr. Carpenter, while you're putting together that opinion, can you also uh, provide a legal opinion based upon state law as to our role with regards to education and if we should be putting our money into schools rather than in community centers in neighborhoods that we where we already own these buildings that don't appear to have enough funding to provide uh, programs. We're always having to scramble or not do something, but we are putting money into uh, schools rather than into buildings and programs in buildings where we actually own. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. Our role as municipal government in the state of Arkansas with regards to the law and it as our role in education and us going into schools providing dollars for programs when we have and own buildings, most of them multi-million dollar buildings that do not have enough funding for operations or programming. And, and can I remind, uh, thank you, Director Wright, can I remind you, Tom, we're to a certain extent already having uh, intervention specialists in schools, in various schools that are have high risk, high risk students. So if we can put that in that perspective, because we're already putting paid employees who work for the city or nonprofits into various schools to help with conflict resolution. So I don't know if that's going to impact your opinion one way or the other, but I want to just at least let you know we have been doing that to a certain extent for the last 20 plus years. Director Hendricks, Mayor. Director Hendricks. Said about education. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I, I don't understand that. Why are we, and I even talked to you personally about. Uh, Mr. J. Barr being elected, appointed, it, it doesn't make sense to me. We have a school district, and, and that's what my constituents are concerned about. So you all can do what you want to do, but when you come to voting, it's a new day. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Director Webb. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two things. I mean, you know, I supported your uh, community schools model from the beginning, and uh, Dr. Barth comes to our CYF meetings every time and gives us an update. And I think um, that we are making a big impact. We may not, we haven't done everything we wanted to do this last year because of COVID, but I think we're making and will continue to make a huge impact in those schools because we stepped out and we did something bold. So I think we have shown, um, or I think we do have a role in that. Um, and I think that we know from the data, the difference that it makes, um, it makes not only a short-term difference, but it makes a lifelong difference in almost every metric that, that we can look at. So that was a comment. That was not my last question, but uh, you know, and Dana and I met last week, and uh, we had a wonderful discussion in community programs and how we want to start be able to spend more time at our meetings, having discussions about things and not just reports. And so I think that we've had some discussion tonight has been a real <laughs> beneficial thing. Um, the the report from Emily and seeing all those opportunities for money. Uh, the concern that we have about the rising cases of domestic violence, the linkage of that to homicides, the, that then going back to early childhood education, going to SEL. I mean, they're just, everything is so linked together. So these discussions, in my opinion, are beneficial and, and necessary. So I'll get to the point of my last question. And I concur. With you. Um, on the affordable housing question, yes, and also we learn things, um, and I feel fortunate that we learn things and things do change. Director Richardson said something, you know, about things where things things change, 
and working in the homeless arena just as a board member um, you know we've talked about jobs and then and now our focus is on housing first and one of the questions that people have raised um, and so we're seeing more people living in their cars we're seeing people who've been housed forever now living in their cars but one question that a lot of people have raised and that you and manager Moore and I've discussed is that we're not hiring uh, you know an increase in staff to go along with the potential new programs and so we we're talking about investing into housing and I commend my state rep McCullough who's tried to work with the state to get us to invest more money in the housing trust fund which we have not but how are we going to put this money into affordable housing can you explain that to people just briefly without hiring a bunch of people to oversee that just so people out who are watching or reading about it in the paper tomorrow have an understanding of it yes ma'am this will dovetail nicely with director howard's existing programming and keeping with what you just shared housing first and the additional funding that we receive from uh, this will augment the dollars that we receive from uh, cbdg which is community development block grant funding that focuses on housing first along which is also aligned with the housing urban development um, federal agency uh, where these dollars will augment those dollars in housing neighborhood programming to uh, purchase and rehab and acquire um, dilapidated um, single family units um, and to uh, then uh, market those and turn over rather uh, to low to moderate income families as well as residents experiencing homelessness. Uh, we will not be adding additional staff for this. This will be turned over to nonprofits. Um, also, the private sector will have the opportunity, as they do now with CBDG, uh, to uh, develop those homes utilizing these dollars. Uh, and so, you know, this will be a funneling mechanism as we do with and augment the CBDG program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Director Wright. I just want to piggyback on that housing component in low to moderate income areas that are truly affordable, like mine, and I enjoy, enjoy it because it is affordable and people can afford to live there and uh, buy a home. We have a issue with code enforcement. And over the years, we have tried and tried and tried to fix code enforcement. But we continue after all of these years to be reactive and not proactive. I have submitted proposal after proposal in various formats uh, for a proactive approach to address some things and we still only respond to complaints and then we get bogged down into the uh, apartment uh, inspections and, and never any real change. And I would like to see if at all possible, going back to this American Rescue Plan, us look at that, and I'm, I apologize, but that just thought just popped into my head when she brought that up. Because I was over in an area off of 34th Street and I was checking out a complaint, and I ran across a street that I had been, I know I've been on that street before, because I remembered going over there looking at another issue uh, when another constituent was alive, he's since deceased. But I noticed that there was like five houses on one side of the street that were empty. They were brick homes, but they were all grown up with weeds. And I have been meaning to get with Director Howard to set up a tour to go back over there and look at those housing and, and see what's going on because it seemed like we might be able to uh, repurpose those houses into quality homes. The street would need some infrastructure, but I would like to see us look at that this is the kind of stuff that uh, neighborhoods need we want to live in affordable areas but we also want uh, code enforcement to be active and uh, doing a proactive approach rather than just responding when there's a complaint that comes in because typically by the time it, the complaint comes down to me people have been complaining and complaining calling 311 over and over and they they tell me that they're not seeing any any improvement and then finally the complaint gets to me and then you got people all upset and then we want them to pass a tax so that's the kind of thing i'm facing out there so 
I wanted to make sure I put that on the table and Kevin, I will be calling you because uh, I ran across that house a week ago and uh, that street a week ago with all those houses. I, I mean, one I could see, but it looked like it was five of them. And we need to, to find out who owns those and see if we can't get those houses back uh, in livable condition. Thank you. And Mayor, just, I mean, one other point my hand was, I don't know if you saw it or not. I, I think that I agree with, with Kathy and Doris about the, the housing uh, issue. One of the things I, I, I'm somewhat intrigued about, and Tom, you can help us legally figure out if this is possible. But one of the things we really need to do is figure out a way to employ some of these ex-felons to help Im improve or rehabilitate those homes and help us with our housing issue because they're from those neighborhoods, they live in those neighborhoods. And we always have these conversations about adding more COPPP officers on the streets. I would suggest or submit to you that if we hire 10 ex-felons, we'll probably have just as much, if not more impact of hiring 30 or 40 additional police officers. So I think we need to figure out a way to expand our reentry program, Bruce. If this funding is allowable for that, Mayor, let's target these areas where we have a disproportionate number of dilapidated houses, dilapidated houses, boarded up homes, vacant homes, boarded up structures, vacant structures, because there's a correlation between vacant structures and criminal activity. So I think we can figure out a way to sit down at the table and get all the proper people at the table singing from the same hymn that we can make this work. So we have far, far too many ex-felons in this community that are not able to get jobs and they're not able to get employment. And we don't have any programs that are really designed to train them and give them skill set to get meaningful, gainful employment once they go through our reentry program. So it'd be a perfect example, a perfect time to do that as a collective body to make sure we're improving not only the infrastructure revitalization, but the human capital revitalization as well. Thank you so much, Director Richardson. Director Phillips. Very, very quick, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, comment uh, and uh, with my colleagues about the neighborhoods and housing and as it relates to childhood education, that those are all uh, things that we haven't done before that I'm excited about us discussing and considering. Uh, I know this uh, proposal has a equitable lens uh, to definitely make Little Rock feel and look different than it has in the past. So I'm, I'm glad to, that, like Director Peck said, that we're having this conversation and we all seem to be on the same page as it relates to equity in our city. And then lastly, I want to have a question for City Manager Moore. Uh, you mentioned us going back to the City Hall boardroom. I just wanted to put it back on your to-do list to let us know when we can do those rotating meetings around sure. now. You may have something now if you do great, but if not, we can wait. We do. Uh, uh, we have to be, our last meeting in here is uh, June the 10th. Um, no, that got changed. So uh, June the 8th, um, we've been, I've been working with Mr. Burton, the uh, principal of Southwest High School. Uh, our IT staff has been out there and uh, we believe we'll be able to host the June 15th meeting um, uh, at, the, at the new Southwest High School. One of the things that uh, we did invest in is at the Center University Park and as far as getting it uh, from a technology standpoint up to speed, so it would be our goal to go in there in August, uh, but we're going to have to find something between June and August um, because, like I said, this room is being booked. Uh, we're working uh, uh, very closely with Dr. Smothers at Philander, uh, to, and 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 I do give them credit to the IT staff and the LRTV staff. They really want to be somewhere consistent, so we're not moving around. It, it, when we adjourn this, Wendell and his staff, they and IT, they got to move all this out because there's somebody moving in tonight. Um, so uh, we're going to try to find a location that we can be consistent for the at least the next two months. And I didn't, you know, I, I mentioned the city boardroom, but I don't really don't see us going back in there for a while. I mean, I, I think that just from an accommodation standpoint, that we got to work on that room. But yeah, I, I, right right now, June fifteenth at Southwest High School. Okay, thank you, City Manager. All right, everyone, thank you so much for the time and attention towards discussing this. You're supposed to. Oh, Tom, uh, you want to make an update? Yes. Uh, prior to the meeting, June June the first, the city is all is trying to go back to normal uh, pre-COVID. 
uh, there have been the accept the acceptance of emails for citizen communication and for uh, comments on items before the board as of the June first meeting. Um, uh, comments to be made. Uh, people need to be here in person and comply with getting the uh, cards for that to the city clerk uh, prior to the beginning of the meeting at six o'clock. Uh, or if it starts at four for another reason before four o'clock. And um, we look forward to seeing you in person when you tell us what we need to hear. All right, thank you so much members of the board for this time and attention towards this proposal as we continue to take feedback, focus on collaboration and coordination uh, to move this sales tax proposal forward, focus on community growth and transformation. Have a blessed day.